be king Infant savior Lying helplessly Wrapped in beauty And humility This is the one We've been waiting for He's worthy of riches And so much more What can to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we're doing so in a series called Who is Jesus? And uh, this sermon series is designed to help us learn a little bit about who Jesus is based on the unique gifts that the wise men have brought to him, and it also is going to tell us a little bit about ourselves. 
I'll give you the context of Matthew chapter 2, where the wise men come to Jesus. I gave you a little bit of that last week, but I want to give you a little bit more this week. You see, it's probably around 18 months after uh, the birth of Jesus where the wise men arrive to meet Jesus. Uh, We know that because we're told in Scripture in Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, that the wise men came to a house, not a barn or a stable, um, not a cave. And so we also know that Herod gave a kill order for all the children, the male children, under the age of two to be executed. And so that says that there's probably a, a passage of time there. And I, I tell you that because it might mess up your manger scene. Um, I, when I went to seminary and I learned all these things, I, I told my mom that, uh, that story, and I actually took her, her wise men and I put them on a shelf over to the right of the manger scene. And uh, I was like, Mom, I just want you to be theologically accurate. And she was like, nerd. And she took them all and she put them right back in her manger scene. Um, so the wise men, I just want you to kind of get a good picture of what was going on here because the wise men, when they saw Jesus, it was more likely he was a toddler. And I really hope that Jesus wasn't like my toddlers. Uh, we've had two kids, and my, uh, my wife and I, we always make this mistake. Around two years old, we always get convicted, and we say, well, it's a real shame that our kids can't set through a dinner without watching our phones, like watching TV, like when we go out to eat and stuff, and we always wind up giving them our phones, and they're watching Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, and we, we get a little bit, you know, we get convicted of that. We're like, man, they can sit there for an hour and have a family meal, and so when we go out to the restaurant, uh, we, uh, we, we say, look, no, no devices, no devices, and so they usually get a little upset. Now, my son, he had this special way of finding the butter knife at the table. We'd push all the silverware away, but he'd still wind up with a butter knife somehow, and he'd start carving on the table or whatever, and my, my daughter, she had the gift of being able to find the salt and pepper, and she'd be like dumping salt and pepper all over the restaurant, and so, you know, we, we'd take those things away from him, and of course, when you take those things away from them, the kids get upset, and they start screaming and crying, and Susan and I look at each other, and we're like, we just got to be strong. We can't give in to the demands of terrorists, because that just makes them so much stronger. Uh, but then eventually, usually about five minutes later, we, uh, we give in, and it's Mickey Mouse Clubhouse coming. So that song is like forever stuck in my brain, because we just gave up. We're just, here's the phone, whatever else, you, here's the keys to the car, uh, whatever, whatever you need, just be quiet so we can enjoy this, this dinner together. So those were my toddlers, and I just don't think Jesus was like that, because when you look at the scripture, It says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. So they were excited to go visit this toddler, Jesus. It says, entering the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure, and they presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So the wise men, they knelt before Jesus, and they gave him these unusual gifts. And I say unusual, not because they were not useful, but because they were extremely expensive. And for a poor peasant family like Mary and Joseph to receive lavish gifts like this was probably just not on their radar. So last week we talked about the gift of frankincense. This was used to cure wounds and to, to help sore tummies. And so it was a good, good gift for Jesus. And this week we're talking about the gift of myrrh. This is what myrrh looks like before it's ground down and made into an oil. And this is an antiseptic. This is something that you would give to someone to help numb the pain. So if Jesus fell down and scraped his knee, his mother would use the myrrh to put on the wound to help ease the pain of the wound. We also see myrrh when Jesus was hanging on the cross. They mixed wine with myrrh and they offered the myrrh to Jesus to help numb the pain. So these gifts are spiritual in nature as well. They're not just practical gifts. They're very spiritual. And frankincense told us that Jesus was going to grow and be our high priest because frankincense was used in the sacrifice of the animal, and it was uh, used to represent the prayers of the people asking for mercy. And so it pointed to the fact that Jesus would one day be the great high priest who would sacrifice his life for us. And myrrh has a similar meaning. Myrrh was also used for embalming. So it's very likely that when Jesus died on the cross before he was put into the tomb, he was embalmed in myrrh. So myrrh tells us that Jesus was born to die. Jesus was born to die for our sins. Isaiah chapter 53 is a powerful passage of scripture that tells us about the the suffering servant that was to come. The cool thing about this passage of scripture is that it was written by a prophet, Isaiah. 
Isaiah was speaking the words that God gave to him, and he spoke these words about the coming Messiah 700 years before Jesus was even born. I actually got to see a a fragment of the Isaiah scroll at the Bible Museum that was dated 100 years before Jesus. So I got to see these words written on parchment that was 100 years before Jesus was ever born. So I can say firsthand that these words were written before Jesus was born. In fact, they were written 700 years. Imagine, do we have any football fans? Any football fans? Well, we must not because football fans make themselves known. They're usually like, yeah, I'm a football fan. Like, they're very loud. Golf fans, not the same. You ask a golf fan, they're like, yeah, golf. But, but football fans, yeah, they let you know it usually. So I guess we don't have any football fans. But imagine if I was able to predict the winner of Super Bowl 55. That'd be pretty impressive, wouldn't it? But then you would say, ah, there's a lot of people out there that are going to guess the winner of Super Bowl 55. Imagine, though, if I could guess the teams that were in the Super Bowl, the winner of the Super Bowl, and the final score of Super Bowl 55. Well, every gambler in America would be following me on Instagram if I was able to do that. But now imagine this. What if I could tell you the teams, the winner, and the final score of Super Bowl 755? That's (laughs) DCCLV. The Super Bowl, 755. Imagine if I could tell you details about that. You would say, man, that's a miraculous. That's supernatural. And that's exactly what Isaiah did. Isaiah prophesied about the details of the coming Messiah's birth and his death and his resurrection 700 years before Jesus was even born. Now, it's important to acknowledge something and that something is that we have a problem. Every single human that's ever been born has a problem, and that problem is that we are sinners. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, We all went astray like sheep. Somebody say, like sheep. sheep. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way. Like sheep. That is not a compliment. Sheep are adorable animals. They are absolutely adorable animals, but they get themselves in trouble. And when they get themselves in trouble, they need a good shepherd or things go bad for them. (laughs) I'm a dad. I'm allowed to make a dad joke. Leave me alone. Things go bad for the sheep, right? Why? Because sheep are defenseless. If a wolf attacks a sheep, the sheep do not have the ability to run from the wolf. They do not have fangs to fight the wolf. They do not spit venom at the wolf. There is nothing they can do to fight off the wolf. In fact, what most sheep do is they get in a big clump and they just tell the wolf, take whichever one of us you want. That's their defense mechanism. Sheep are also followers. You might have heard people say, well, they're just a bunch of sheep. And what that means is they're just a bunch of followers because sheep will follow and they'll even follow their fellow sheep into danger. Now, I've heard pastors say that like my whole life, but I've never actually fact-checked that before. So I got on Google and I typed in sheep, follow, and then like disaster. And the very first thing that comes up is a story from July 8th, 2005 in Turkey, where one sheep wandered off a 15-meter cliff, which is about 45 feet. So one sheep wandered off the cliff, and then 1,500 other sheep followed that sheep by wandering off of the cliff. So the bad news, sorry, I'm done. I'm done. The bad news, bad news, no more. The bad news is 400, the first 400 sheep died when they fell. The good news, I guess, is that the other 1,100 sheep did not die because they had a nice little sheep pillow to land on when they fell off the cliff. That's a 100% true story. I did not embellish that in the slightest. But what it does is it proves the fact that sheep are followers, and they will follow each other even into danger. Sheep are also wanderers. They're they're curious. They're like, I want this. Uh, I'll try this. What's this? And when they wander, they wander off the path, and they become isolated, and they get anxious, and they get stressed out, and they get overwhelmed, and sometimes they become downcast. They, they, They get so stressed out, they fall over, and they can't get themselves back up. And so what this passage of Scripture is telling us is that we are sheep, and we have a tendency to wander away from all of the good things that God has for us. And that, my friends, is called sin. It's what we talked about last week. It's the sinfulness of humanity opposed to the holiness of God. And sinfulness 
and holiness cannot be in the same place. So what happens is the problem we have is when we sin, we have separated ourselves from God. We have broken our relationship with God. And so we need God to solve our problem. And that's what he promises to do. He says, we all went astray like sheep. We have all turned our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. This is incredible when you read it in the light of the fact that it was written 700 years before Jesus was ever born. It says that one person would be punished for the sin of all of humanity. Then it gives this little detail. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. And if you read the story of Jesus' crucifixion, that's exactly what happened. He was tried and accused of all these things that he was innocent of, but yet he did not open his mouth. Not one time did he try to defend himself. Last week we talked about the frankincense and the fact that Jesus represents the great high priest that would come and sacrifice himself for the sin of the world. And today we're looking at myrrh, and myrrh is related to death because it's used in embalming. And what it's telling us is that the solution to our problem was the death of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, verse 3, tells us a little bit about our our Savior. Again, written 700 years before any of these events took place, and it's amazing how accurate it is. It says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was, He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sickness. He carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. So why should you follow Jesus? Just look at the magnitude of the suffering that he endured for you. Look at the cost of his sacrifice that he made for you. And friends, I'm sorry, but this does not leave any room for casual Christianity. When you truly acknowledge what Jesus went through on your behalf so that you could be saved through faith in him, so that you could be adopted into God's family, so that you could live in heaven for all of eternity, when you look at what he did for you, it leaves no room for casual Christianity. When I first encountered this, The pastor preached a a passage of scripture very similar to this. And he said, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. And then he looked out at the audience and he said, he said, you were the joy that was set before him. You're the reason he endured the cross. And in that moment, I realized the amazing love that God had for me. And I gave my life fully and completely to Jesus Christ. Think about Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, right before he went to the cross, he's He's praying in the garden, and when he, get a gl- he gets a glimpse of what, it, what the weight of his sin would actually look like, because he took, Jesus was perfect in every way, but he took the weight of the, the world's sin on his shoulders, and in that moment, God gave him a glimpse of what that would look like, and he was praying so hard. He was asking his father, he's saying, if there's any other way, let the cup pass from me. But there was no other way. And so he's praying so hard that blood actually dripped from his brow. It's called hemosiderosis, and it accompanies extreme trauma. It's a real event that happens when people go through trauma. They actually begin to sweat blood. So Jesus was sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. His soul was overwhelmed to the point of death. And yet he said, Father, not my will, but yours be done. If this is what it takes to love Kevin to love Susan, to love Eli, to love Emery. If this is what it takes, then Father, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. At that point, he was arrested. He was falsely accused. He was tried for things that he'd never done. He was convicted, and he was convicted to be sentenced to death on the cross. And so they stripped him and they put a crown of thorns on his head and they they spit on him and they struck him and they beat him to the point where he was unrecognizable even as a human. Then they gave him a cross to carry 650 yards down a path known as the way of suffering to a hill that was called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And on that place, he was nailed to a cross and lifted on to a device that was reserved for criminals and traitors and wicked people. 
And perhaps the most heartbreaking thing that we see in this entire scene is when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The only time in Scripture where, God, where Jesus does not refer to God as Father, but as God. Again, it shows us the separation between sin and holiness. They can't be in the same place, and so there was distance even between Jesus and God in this moment because Jesus had absorbed the sin of the entire world. And then people offered him myrrh. They offered him myrrh to help numb the pain, and Jesus refused their offering. And then he said, it is finished, and to your hands I commit my spirit. The job was almost done. Jesus' mission was almost complete. The perfect sacrifice had now been made. And it's amazing that the prophet Isaiah, 700 years before this event, could declare what this baby that was born of a virgin who would never sin, who could declare what he would endure on our behalf. And then he goes on and tells us what happens afterwards. Things get much better. Look at verse 8. He was taken away because of the oppression and judgment. And who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with the rich man at his death. Isn't that an amazing little fact that Isaiah just throws out there for us? You see, normally when someone was crucified, they'd be buried with all the other wicked criminals that were crucified. But Jesus didn't get buried with them. He got buried in a rich man's tomb because Joseph of Arimathea was so moved by what he saw in Jesus that he gave him his tomb. This rich man gave up his own tomb for Jesus. So this prophecy even came true. Because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. After his anguish, he will see the light and he will be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will carry their iniquities. Jesus was buried, and three days later, he rose from the dead, just like Isaiah prophesied. And it says that he would see the light, and Jesus did indeed see the light. God's wrath was now satisfied. Our problem was solved. Jesus had died. And so if we place our faith in Jesus, we can be forgiven of our sin. We can receive the justification that Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 53. Our broken relationship with God can be restored thanks to the sacrifice of Jesus. So what sets Christianity apart from Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam? It's the fact that God became flesh and sacrificed himself for us. God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. Isaiah said he was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed Because of our sin, he was beaten so that we could be made whole. By his stripes, we are healed. All the other religions, they require something from you in order to receive a blessing, but not Christianity. Christianity is simply God giving us the best gift ever, Jesus Christ. And that's why we can have a merry, merry Christmas. See, myrrh was this substance that was given to Jesus, but it was more than just something for to to ease the pain. It was foreshadowing how Jesus was born to die for the sins of the world. And Jesus understood this gift very well, maybe more so than Mary and Joseph. He understood exactly the spiritual significance of this gift because in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, as he talks to his disciples, he he tells them exactly what's going to happen in the future. He said, "'It is necessary that the Son of Man,' that's Jesus' name for himself, It is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief chief priests, the scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Then he said to them all, if anybody wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Christianity is not something you just add on to your life. It's not not a little add-on. If you want to find life, then find Jesus. It's, It's the wholeness of life. And Christmas is a celebration of this child that was born of a virgin that was sent from heaven, who would never sin, who lived a perfect life, who would die a sinner's death, who would rise from the dead, paying the price for my sin. He endured this because he loved you. He endured this because he loved me. And even though we are sheep and we wander into sinfulness, Jesus still loves us even at our worst. So what should we do? We should take up our cross and we should follow him. 
If you truly understand the love that he has for you, then all the other things that the world offers you to distract you from what's most important, they, they pale in comparison to the fact that Jesus declared his love for you from that cross. And it's a role that he's given to a lot of you to, to take this message and share it with others. This is called the gospel. You hear that in church a lot, but some of us don't know what it means. Gospel just means good news. It's the good news of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. It's the good news of the freedom we can have from sin and death. It's the good news that our sin has been paid for on the cross thanks to the sacrifice of Jesus. And yes, we're all called to tell people the good news, but some of you are gifted in very specific ways, in ways that help you share the good news. We talked about it last week, but what does, what does Murr tell us about ourselves? Well, frankincense told us that in this church, there are prophets or there are priests, there are people who do what Jesus did, who take care of people, who sacrifice and who pray. And we thanked God for all of the priests last week. But of the three things that Jesus did on earth, he was a, a priest and he was a prophet and he was a king. He handed those responsibilities off to us. So some of you have been gifted as priests and others have been gifted as prophets. Prophets are people like me that tell the good news of Jesus to others. Now, we should all do that, like I said, but some of you do it in very specific ways. Some of you invite people to your house to tell them about Jesus. Some of you at work start Bible studies so you can tell people about Jesus. Some of you knock on doors to tell people. Some of you write letters. Some of you post on social media. Some of you teach. Some of you preach. Some of you sing the gospel. Some of you, some of you just go in your neighborhood and just anybody you meet, you just tell them about Jesus. You've been gifted in the area of prophecy. And I just want you to know that I thank God for you. I thank God for the fact that you are willing to go out and tell other people the good news about Jesus. And I want you to know that your church is thankful for you as well. So can we just let the prophets in our midst, can we just let them know how thankful we are for them, for telling us about Jesus, for using their gifts in that way? Some of you today is the first day where you realized how much Jesus loved you. Maybe you've heard the gospel message hundreds of times, but this is the first time that it's ever taken root in your heart. The Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of your heart, and he's saying, look, it doesn't matter that you went to church. It doesn't matter that grandma and grandpa were Christians. It, it doesn't matter if your name's on the church roll. It doesn't matter if you're a good person. What matters is you have a personal relationship with Jesus. And so I want you to give... I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that, that longing, that knocking. I want you to respond to Jesus, and we're going to do it together. Even if you're already a Christian, I want you to say this prayer so the people that are saying it will not feel alone. So just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, forgive all my sins. <clears throat> Jesus, save me. Jesus, make me new. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose from the dead so that I could live for you. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you, so I can be faithful to you. Show your love in all that I do. My life is not my own. I give it all to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And the Bible says if you said those words, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that today is the day that you receive salvation. And we want to celebrate with you. We want to celebrate with you. So if you could just let someone know about the decision you made, because we want to celebrate and we want to give you the tools to grow in your faith to be the disciples that God called you to be, to carry on one of those, those legacies of prophet, priest, and king. Father, we're so grateful for the hearts that were just given to you, Lord. I thank you for the gospel message. I thank you for the good news. I thank you for all that you did for us. I thank you for those that responded to the invitation. Pray that you'd help them to grow in their faith. And Lord, as your love fills our hearts. Help us to shout it from the mountaintops. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.